Hey, this is Coach Boyston. In this screencast, we're going to be looking at the impact of environmental change. Now, for us to understand that, we have to understand that our globe, our planet, is broken up into all of these different environments. We call these biomes, and they're very, very unique. So if we look up here at the desert, um, and you know the desert, we find those in areas like here in North Africa or even the Middle East. Um, we also have, uh, if we look here in the western United States, you have some out there towards Nevada, uh, Arizona, those areas. You'll notice that the desert is very unique. It's different than, say, the rainforest, which is down here. And we find rainforest in areas of South America, even in Central America. And you got some in India and Africa over here as well. But um, there's differences there. And so these, these biomes are very, very unique. And the organisms that live in, say, a desert biome are going to be different than the ones that live in a rainforest because there's similar needs in each one of those. So if you're in a desert, you're going to have to have a similar adaptation that's going to allow you to survive. All those organisms got to be really similar. They got to be adapted to living in a very low precipitation environment. They also got to be adapted to living in very dry, hot environment. You know, as opposed to a rainforest that is also hot, but it gets a lot more precipitation and rain. And so the organisms are going to be more adapted there. And so if we were to try to take a plant or tree out of this rainforest and put it up there in the desert, it's just not going to work out well for that plant. It's not adapted to that environment. Um, we have some other ones, just some common ones, uh, like where the polar bear here is. This is the tundra. We can see the areas that occurs here and even over here. You have your grasslands, real similar to what's around us. You know, if you look over here, we have the grasslands all the way up through here, Oklahoma, Kansas, and above us. Um, and so these different biomes and environments have factors that affect organisms. And what we call those factors is biotic and abiotic. And so biotic is going to be living factors in the environment. So if you're an animal, it's going to be all the other animals or all the other plants. It's going to be the living factors within that environment that could affect you or make up that biome. The abiotic factors are going to be non-living things like you can see here, uh, light. So if you're a plant, the availability of light, um, the pH of the soil, temperature, um, water, chemical environment, which would be, uh, there's a lot of different forms of that. I know a lot of the environmental change that's occurring because of chemical environment is things caused by humans in the form of pollution. And so each one of these biomes is very unique and we got these living and non-living factors that make up that environment. It's when change happens to those that organisms can be affected. And so it brings me to this topic. It's called biotic potential versus environmental resistance. So what does that mean? Um, we know what potential means, hopefully. So if you've ever heard somebody say, hey, man, you're not reaching your potential. All right, it means you're not reaching your maximum ability. And so biotic means life. Potential means reaching its maximum ability. And so it's the potential for life. Meaning, uh, and it comes from this term here we call carrying capacity. If an organism, these biotic and abiotic factors are working in the favor of an organism, then that organism is going to be able to just grow and reproduce. There's nothing slowing it down. There's no illness. There's not a need for more food. There's plenty of food. If you're a plant, there's plenty of light and water. That organism is going to grow exponentially, all right, without anything hindering it to a capacity. What I mean by capacity is there's only so many organisms that an environment can support. I mean, look at our planet. At some point, there's going to be too many humans and too many organisms. There's not enough be, be enough shelter or food for, for that many people. And so we will reach that someday, all right? No, no time soon, but someday. But your biotic potential is the potential for those just growing. There's nothing hindering that organism from reproducing and continuing to grow and develop. The difference is, though, there's environmental resistance. And a lot of times that comes in a lot of forms um, between these abiotic and biotic factors, but we call these limiting factors. So if you're a plant and all of a sudden there's big trees that grow around you and you're not getting enough light, well, if you're not getting enough light, then you probably can't do photosynthesis real well, then that's going to be a limiting factor. That's an environmental resistance. And it'd actually be an abiotic, um, a non-living factor that is affecting you. So to give you a couple examples here, let's look at, these are some grasses that grow in the grassland biome, uh, particularly some wetland area. And so what are some things that are going to allow you to thrive? Well, plenty of water, um, the temperature being right, it's not too hot, not too cold, you can grow, plenty of nutrients in the soil, not a whole lot of predators feeding on you as a plant. So if all those things are working in your favor, this plant's going to grow exponentially and reach its biotic potential. Now, if we start to see some of these things start to work against it as an environmental resistance, so let's say there's a temperature change in this region and it gets really, really hot. It starts to dry out the soil so there's less precipitation and there's less moisture in the soil. 
then we would call those factors that are now limiting the ability of this organism to, to reach its potential, we call those limiting factors. And so if the water and precipitation had just stopped raining for a year, well, water would become a limiting factor for this organism because that's the resource that is in short supply. And so, again, this, they can't reach its potential. Another example is our predator-prey relationships. And so, uh, if you're just looking at this diagram, let's say our prey here in the black, let's say that's a rabbit, and let's say our red predator here is a wolf. Well, you'll notice um, they're both kind of low. And so, they're not, they're not just real high, but there's a low prey population. And so, the first thing that happens when there's a low prey population for our wolf is that is a limiting factor for a wolf if there's not enough food. And so we see a decline in the number of wolf population, all right, because that's an environmental resistance for them. On the other hand, though, for the rabbit, if there's a decline in the number of predators, what's that for the rabbit? That's going to be a good thing for the rabbit. And so that rabbit population starts to grow, starts to exponentially grow, trying to reach its biotic potential for that environment. The problem is with most predator and prey, it always works back and forth. So if the prey population starts to increase, what does that do for our wolf population? Now there's plenty of food, and so we start to see an increase in the wolf population or predator population because of that. Because now that limiting factor of not enough prey has been removed, so now we start to see that exponential growth of our wolf. And now once there's plenty of predators, our prey, what's going to happen to our prey? we're going to see those numbers decline. So it's kind of a back and forth there between no environmental resistance, environmental resistance, and so on between our predator and prey. But again, if these biotic or abiotic factors are working in your favor, you can reach your potential. If they're not, they're going to be a limiting factor um, or an environmental resistance. The final one I want to talk about is this chemical um, abiotic factor, which is chemical uh, environment. And a lot of this is done through pollution. I was doing a little research, and so we're talking about the impact of change on an environment. Well, chemicals play a big role in environmental change, uh, pollution by humans particularly. Um, in World War II, this drug is called DDT. All right, It's not a wrestling move, All right, but it's called DDT. It was used in World War II actually to combat malaria and typhus. And so it was able to fend off, you know, we do spraying around here for West Nile virus uh, for mosquitoes. Uh, this was a chemical that was sprayed and uh, used for treatment of mosquitoes and fleas and ticks um, to help combat malaria and typhus during World War II. And then after the war, they came back and they, they liked it so much, they thought it had zero effect on us. They thought it had zero effect on the organisms of the environment. And so they started using it as a farming product. You see down here in the bottom here, you see these ladies standing out on the farm just getting sprayed. I mean, because they really thought it had no effect on us. Um, and so, but they, they actually think it had a big role of eliminating malaria completely from the United States, even in Europe. And uh, so it was, it was a drug that, or a chemical that they really thought was great. Um, you can see this ad up here in the top left. I love some of these pictures, just how naive we are sometimes about what we do. But it says, protect your children against disease and it's wallpaper that is lined with DDT. Real interesting. Um, you can see over here in the top right, can you imagine going to school and, and treating you for head lice? little lice that would grow in your hair, treating you for head lice by spraying this chemical all over you. You're breathing it in, it's getting in your eyes, everything. Um, you got these kids swimming and we're spraying across the top of them. So um, DDT um, has been linked, just so you know, has been linked to diabetes, to breast cancer, to infertility uh, in humans. And so it has a lot of issues that it has caused within us. Um, and actually, it's still affecting us to the point that in 2005, they did a study where they pulled some people's blood and they tested it. And almost all, to me, that says about 98%, 99% had DDT in their blood. I would imagine I'm old enough that I have DDT in my blood. Even you may have DDT in your blood in some form. So it does have an effect. And so how does it affect the environment? I wanted to give you one example. Um, we have our falcon here. Falcon populations around the time of the 60s, um, 50s and 60s, when this was being used heavily as a farm product in the United States, we saw the falcon populations drop drastically. Scientists believed it was a fertility thing. It thinned the eggshells and caused it, made, made it hard for these falcons to reproduce. And so we saw their numbers drop. So that's a big environment of this chemical or environmental change that it effect that it had on this falcon. The population has started to drop drastically because of this environmental change. And just to kind of give you an idea of how that works, 
Um, and we've seen this before, kind of we've got our food chain going up, our food pyramid. Um, you have the producers here at the bottom. You'll notice these little dots represent the DDT. There's not a high concentration within our producers, but you can see within every level as we go up, there's more and more concentration to where we reach our falcon here. You can see just how highly concentrated. So these numbers here on the right represent the concentration levels. So in our falcon, it is a lot more highly concentrated than down there in our producers. And so, and the reason for that, I wanted to read and I wanted to find out why that was. Um, we know that things like sugar and stuff can dissolve into water. DDT, this chemical, actually has the ability to dissolve into lipids or fats. So it gets dissolved and it just sticks there in our lipids and fats. And so when one organism eats another, that's why the concentration gets more and more within the next organism to where it gets really highly concentrated up there at the top of the food chain. So for our falcon here, he is going to be greatly affected by this. Other organisms will as well, but the falcon is going to be greatly uh, com compared to, say, our producers down here at the bottom. And to conclude with some data here on this change, if we look down here at this this chart that we have, uh, remember I told you around 1972 is when the United States banned the use of DDT uh, for farming and those things. You'll notice is around 1976, these falcons, the population has started to go up. And so there's a direct correlation here between this DDT in the environment and its effect on the environment so much so that it's affecting the falcons populations that now that we've banned it, those populations are starting to increase again. And so, uh, again, this was uh, just the impact of environmental change. And so these ecosystems, like I said, they're stable. The organisms that are there are adapted to those environments. And if there's a change within the biotic or abiotic factors, those can become resistance for those organisms or limiting factors, and they can obviously uh, have an impact on those organisms in that environment. So, you know, I'm Coach Boydston. Hopefully that was helpful. You guys have a good day.